Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to the Tata Steel Analyst Call. Please note that this meeting is being recorded. All the attendees audio and video has been disabled from the backend and will be enabled subsequently. I would now like to hand the conference over to Ms. Samita Shah. Thank you and over to you, ma'am. Good afternoon to all our viewers in India and a very good evening to those of you joining us from the Far East and a good morning to our viewers from the West. On behalf of Tata Steel, I'm delighted to welcome you all to this call, particularly our shareholders and shareholders of Tata Steel Long Products. Thank you for taking the time out on this call to discuss our results for the fourth quarter of FY22. Our results, including a presentation explaining the performance, has been uploaded on our website, and I hopefully many of you have had a chance to go through it. To discuss our results, we have with us our CEO and MD, Mr. TV Narendran, and our ED and CFO, Mr. Kaushik Chatterjee. They will take you through our results and answer any questions you may have. Just before we move on, I um, just want to inform you that on the audio queue, we will take questions on audio as well as chat. Uh, please do type in your name, your email address, uh, so that your, uh, the operator can unmute your line. And of course, uh, you know, if you have chat questions, please type them in as well. Uh, as always, uh, this entire discussion will be covered by the safe harbor clause, which is on page two of our presentation. Thank you, and over to you, Nari. Thank you, Samita. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening, depending on where you're joining from. Uh, I'll make a few comments, uh, hand over to Kaushik, and then uh, uh, we'll be ready to answer the questions uh, that you may have. So uh, uh, the pack is already there uh, with all of you. Uh, as you know, commodities in general and steel markets in particular have been very volatile over the last quarter, and the ongoing Russia-Ukraine crisis coupled with the COVID wave in China obviously have added uh, complexities to the supply chain. It has, of course, uh, kept the demand supply balance uh, in some sense uh, uh, a bit volatile, uh, but uh, the reality is with Russian and Ukrainian steel out of the market, at least in Europe, we're seeing a certain tightness in the supply. The coking coal prices witnessed a renewed volatility with a steep rise followed by a decline towards the end of the quarter. Uh, they still remain at around $500, which is uh, quite high considering what we've seen over the last uh, many years and decades. With recovering demand in Europe and the US, steel prices in the Western markets uh, rose sharply in, the, in, January to, in the January to the March quarter. And in China, the lockdown on key markets had an impact on demand and led to a broadly stable steel prices. As a result, Western spot spreads have been elevated while Chinese steel spreads have softened. In India, the steel demand rose 4% quarter on quarter and automotive production, especially in passenger and commercial vehicles, improved while the infrastructure construction goods witnessed steady growth. Against this backdrop, Tata Steel delivered record performance during the quarter and the year with strong performance across geographies. In India, our crude steel production crossed 19 million tons for the first time, with quarterly production being close to 5 million tons. Our deliveries at 5.12 million tons in the quarter were the highest ever. I'm happy to point out that in addition to higher volumes, we were able to also deliver better net realizations than our guidance. Against our guidance of a drop of around 3,500 rupees per ton, we were able to limit the drop to about 1,500 rupees a ton. The performance was broad-based with all segments doing well, and our market share in auto, auto is now the highest. In branded products and retail also, we crossed 5.2 billion tons, and in the industrial products and projects segment and engineering segment, we crossed 6.3 million tons with a sustained focus on high-end sales. Our downstream portfolios across tubes, wires, tin plate, etc., is also expanding well. Just to give you a sense, we now sell over a million tons of tubes on the back of strong growth in structural and high-end sales. In fact, uh, if those of you have seen the pack, the picture that you see on the front page of the pack is basically a steel structure. It's a tubular section, which is uh, goes under the brand name Tata Structura. It's a tribute to Sodorab Tata and the Dorab Tata Park in Jamshedpur. Uh, moving to Europe, we've had a very good quarter and delivered strong performance with an EBITDA for the year exceeding 1.2 billion pounds. Deliveries were up 9% during the quarter compared to the third quarter. Steel prices remain elevated and our net realization quarter on quarter was higher by about 53 pounds per ton, which is better than both our guidance uh, uh, and the movement in the one month lagged Northwest Europe HRD spot price benchmark index. Uh, uh, I have previously explained how our contract and product mix has meant that INR performance tends to be different from the benchmark. We can have a different mix of uh, long-term contracts. Uh, in fact, we have a different mix in Netherlands as compared to the UK, 
Netherlands is more dependent on the packaging and the auto sectors and hence have a greater mix of long-term contracts. Previously, the improvements on our net realizations in Europe were lower than the benchmark, but the trend is now reversed and the same is expected to continue in the next quarter as well. Uh, we remain watchful on input costs, including energy prices in the near term. In terms of projects, uh, we should commission the 6 million ton uh, pellet plant in Kalinganagar by early of early third quarter of this year, which has an impact on our costs, uh, beneficial impact on our costs. And we will also commission the cold rolling mill. We will start with the uh, cold rolling mill and follow it with the continuous and, and annealing line and the galvanizing lines. Again, the uh, PLTCM, which is a cold rolling mill per se, should get commissioned by the third quarter of this financial year. In the next financial year, we will commission all the balance facilities in Kalinganagar. The Nilachal acquisition uh, should also close this quarter. And as mentioned earlier, it gives us a fourth site in India. In fact, uh, it's uh, next to the Kalinganagar site. It's just across the road. Uh, the Nilachal is part, uh, acquisition gives us access to 6,000 acres of land between the Lachel and the existing Kalinganagar site, which uh, gives us the op optionality to build a complex of at least 25 million tons in Kalinganagar. Uh, in, uh, in addition, we are also setting up the first, uh, uh, one of our first EF uh, facilities in the north, uh, which will be supported by the scrap recycling facility that we've already set up in Rotak. The EF facility is uh, likely to come up in Punjab. And uh, uh, we will be replicating this model of uh, making steel through the recycling route in the other uh, geographies as well, which is uh, the west and the south. In the east, we will largely be iron ore based uh, uh, production of steel. All of this will enable us to uh, reach 40 million tons in India by 2030. We want to do it in a sustainable manner. And to enable this, we've taken multiple initiatives throughout the year not only from using higher scrap in the in our furnaces in the in Jabshipur, Kalinganagar and Angul, but also we've been working with multiple startups on various carbon capture and usage facilities. We've already commissioned a five ton per day CO2 plant at Jamshipur. Uh, we are also using uh, multiple modes of transport to reduce our carbon footprint, including using electric vehicles as well as uh, inland waterways for transporting material. I'm happy to share that in recognition of this sustained effort, Stata Steel has now been recognized as a steel sustainability champion for the fifth year in a row by the World Steel and is now also a member of the new sustainability charter. I'll now hand over to Kaushik for his comments. Thank you. Thank you, Narin. Uh, good afternoon and good morning to everybody who's uh, joined in. Uh, a few comments on the financial performance. Um, Tata Steel's consistent performance across quarters uh, during this financial year has led to a record performance for the year with more than 100% growth in the consolidated debita and four times the growth in the profit after tax compared to the previous year. This is despite the fact that the, the complex global operating environment that has led to surge in the input prices, as you are aware, the consolidated debita for the full year stood at 63,830 crores. Uh, which works out to be a margin of 26% and the EBITDA per ton of around 21,626. The cash flow for the year, uh, the free cash flow for the year was about 27,185 crores. During the quarter, uh, the consolidated EBITDA stood at about 15,174 crores and was marginally lower compared to the previous year. If we uh, exclude the forex impact and the adjusted EBITDA was flat at about 15,891 crores uh, compared to the third quarter. Uh, at Tata Steel standalone, uh, higher material costs were driven by inventory liquidation that we did during the fourth quarter and the elevated code prices, um, partly offset by royalty. The forex gain stood at about 597 crores uh, in the quarter. Again, excluding this, the adjusted EBITDA stood at about 11,766 crores which translates to an EBITDA per ton of about uh, 23,690 rupees. At Tata Steel Europe, uh, we have seen an expansion in the margin uh, in the compared to the third quarter. The third quarter EBITDA numbers were about 13%. Um, the EBITDA margin for this quarter is about 16%. The material costs were uh, up by about 40 pounds per ton, primarily again driven by the inventory liquidation, higher energy prices, and employee related costs. But this was partly offset by the uh, lower raw material costs and the other expense. 
the rise in uh, coking coal uh, consumption costs was offset by the decline in the iron ore prices. Uh, overall costs were up by only about eight pounds per ton, while steel realizations were higher by about 53 pounds per ton, leading to an EBITDA per ton uh, increase of about 45 pounds, which uh, translates to 430 uh, pounds, million pounds. Uh, the EBITDA performance was uh, has led to a strong cash flow performance uh, of about 13,971 crores, despite an increase in the working capital of about 9,600 crores. Uh, while there has been an increase in the absolute value of the inventory um, and the debtors due to the higher prices, the working capital management has uh, led to a decline in terms of holding days, both in on a queue on queue as well as a year on year basis. The capital expenditure um, was about 10,522 crores, which is well within our guidance of uh, 10 to 12,000 that we did earlier during the year. Uh, Finance costs were about uh, 1,099 crores uh, lower by about 434 crores as there were charges related to prepayment of uh, SFA debt in Tata Steel Europe in the third quarter. Uh, taxes paid were 2,000 crores and uh, lower primarily due to tax credit in Europe. Uh, coming to the TSLP acquisition of uh, Nilachal Dispat, we expect to close the transaction in the first quarter. We would have uh, liked to infuse equity into TSLP, but due to regulatory constraints, what we have done is we have infused the funding through non-convertible redeemable preference shares to limit the cash burden on the TSLP balance sheet. Um, we continue to uh, focus on our deleveraging while advancing our strategic growth uh, priorities that Narin highlighted a little while back. At the start of this financial year, we had set a target of uh, deal, uh, achieving the investment grade rating uh, and given our financial matrix, we achieved it within the first six months. Um, against a deleveraging target uh, that we have announced of a billion dollars every year, uh, we have actually repaid uh, double of that, uh, about 15,000 crores during the year. Our net debt to EBITDA uh, has now further improved to 0.8x, and our financial matrix continued to be well within the investment grade level. Our group liquidity position remains strong at about 37,470 crores with uh, about 24,500 crores of cash and cash equivalent. We are obviously holding the higher cash due to the impending uh, NINL acquisition and it will uh, normalize uh, over time. As uh, mentioned in the press release and uh, would be aware by now, the board has recommended a, a record dividend of 51 rupees per share and has also approved the splitting of uh, the shares to rupee one uh, per share, uh, face value on a 10 is to one split. Um, with this, I would like to end my comments and uh, open the floor for questions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We will now begin with the question and answer session. We will be taking questions on audio and chat. As mentioned, to join the audio queue, please mention your full name and email ID in the chat box. Kindly stick to a maximum of two questions per participant and rejoin the queue should you have a follow-up question. We will unmute your mic so that you can ask your question. To ask questions on chat, please type in your question along with your full name and email ID in the chat box. We will now wait for a moment as the queue assembles. Our first question is from Amit Dixit of Edelweiss. Please go ahead. Amit, are you able to hear us? It looks like we have lost our line with Amit. Yeah, sure, Amit, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the opportunity, sir. Uh, I have two questions. The first one is on uh, cooking coal price. So what was the increase in cooking coal price in uh, TSC and Indian operations in Q4? And what is the kind of increase we expect in uh, Q1 of this year? So that is the first question. Uh, the second question is essentially you mentioned about 40 million tons uh, capacity by CY30. So just wanted to understand how much of this production would be through traditional route and how much would be through scrap uh, based route. Yeah. 
So, Amit, on your first question, uh, basically in Q4, the poking coal price increased uh, was about uh, $50 uh, compared to the previous uh, quarter as far as India is concerned. And as far as Europe is concerned, it was about 50 euros uh, per ton. Q4 compared to Q3. Q1 compared to Q4 in India, we expect to be about $100. And again in Europe, about uh, 50 to 60 euros. That's the... Uh, the consumption cost impact I'm talking about, not the paying cost. It's largely what will flow through on the cost side. As far as uh, 40 million tons is concerned, the first quality of about 0.75 million tons uh, will be announced in the next uh, few weeks uh, and uh, uh, about the next two years. Uh, but we are looking at uh, replicating this. And when you look at replicating it, you can replicate it very fast. So, depending on the success of this uh, model, we can scale very fast and add a million tons a year if we want. But we will take that call in the next uh, year, depending on how often it will be performed. There will be a lot of echo and feedback in the call. So, maybe I'll need to answer some questions. No, no, I could hear you, sir. I have uh, more questions. I will get back in the queue. Thank you. Our next question is from Sumangal Nevatia of Kotak. Please go ahead. Poking coal, I mean, what sort of cost headwinds are we seeing both in India and Europe? And if you could just uh, elaborate a little bit on how this entire energy issue ex uh, is impacting our European business in coming quarters, uh, what is the exposure? Uh, how do we hedge or uh, uh, these details, please? Thank you. So, Mangal, I missed the first part of your question. I just picked it up from where you said coking coal. Did you say something before that? Uh, no, so we understood about coking coal. Just want to okay. uh, hear about other cost headwinds, both in India sure. and more so in Europe. Yeah. Sure. So I think uh, pretty much all input costs have been going up uh, across geographies because uh, inflation is something which impacts us also. But obviously, you try and offset as much of that as possible through what you can get from the market, not only through price increases, but also in terms of deciding which markets to sell in. Because, for instance, just now, the prices in Europe are higher than the prices in Asia, even if you want to export. Right. So we've been doing all that, and we are quite comfortable or confident that the cost increases for this quarter can be covered by the price increases that we've got or will get uh, in this quarter, both in Europe and in India. As far as energy costs are concerned, yes, uh, uh, we also hedge energy costs in Europe. So we are exposed past, uh, part is very little. So typically last quarter, I think we were 90% hedged. This quarter, we are at least 75, 80% hedged. And uh, we don't as yet see a significant impact uh, given our hedging, as well as given the costs which have already come through in the last quarter. So if I look at this quarter compared to last quarter, as of now, on energy, we are seeing uh, stable input costs at obviously a higher level than we've seen in the past. The next question is from Pinakin Parikh. Please go ahead. Prices, North European HRC is up nearly 400 euros. Uh, India domestic HRC prices at a spot level are up by 10,000 rupees a ton. Now, Tata has, uh, you know, multiple contracts, multiple segment consumers. So can you just walk us through what kind of NSR increases can we expect in the next two quarters, both in India and Europe? So, Pinakin, uh, uh, basically to come to the last part of your question, we are expecting realizations in India, this quarter to be about 8,000 to 8,500 rupees per ton higher than the last quarter. And uh, in Europe, we are expecting it to be about 60 euros per ton higher than the previous quarter. I am not yet going to give a guidance for next quarter. We'll do that uh, closer to the end of but, uh, this uh, but it, uh, it would be fair to say that the NSR increase will not fully reflect the spot uh, steel price increase, right? Uh, so it's like this, right? Uh, if you look at Europe, uh, you know, in uh, Europe, the contracted prices, uh, which we contracted again in November, December, the auto and the packaging contracts were actually higher than the spot prices of January. Okay, because we had got significant price increases 
uh, which are closer to the spot prices of November, December, which were quite high. But now the spot prices in Europe have also gone up, thanks to what's happening in U uh, Ukraine, and it's come close to our contracted prices. We had expected this year the spot prices to be less than the contracted prices. Last year, the contracted prices were lower than the spot prices. But today, where it stands is both the spot prices and the contracted prices are close to each other and are at a high level in Europe. Uh, as the spot prices, if and when they drop, you will see that impact, but 60 to 70 percent of uh, Netherlands mix is more on long-term contracted prices. In UK, it's a bit less, maybe about 40 percent is on long-term contracted prices. So we are a little bit more riding with the wave uh, as far as spot prices are concerned. In India, uh, we are about uh, 20 to 30 percent on uh, uh, you know contracts beyond a month. Uh, that those are largely the auto contracts, and uh, those are still getting negotiated for uh, H1. Yeah, Q1 or H1. So those negotiations are going on. Yeah. Now, thank you for this detailed answer. My second question is, uh, if you go back to slide nine, where uh, the company has laid out the plan till 2030. Now, existing capacity is 21 million tons, uh, and uh, the KP of uh, 5 million tons will come through over the next 12 to 18 months. So that takes it to roughly 26 million tons. That leaves 14 million tons of capacity addition over the next uh, seven to eight years. Uh, and some of it, as uh, you have highlighted, would be electric arc furnace. Now, now, the land for uh, all this expansion is now already been acquired, whether it's Nilanchal or Bhushan. Uh, so it's fair to say that the capex per ton uh, should be lower than $1,000, which was uh, the benchmark. So if you look at uh, the remaining capacity addition of 14 million tons or so and assume a $750 a ton, that basically means that the growth capex should be ballpark $10 billion over the next seven years or so. Now, obviously, it will not be linear. There will be years of more capex and less capex. But given where the balance sheet is today and given where steel cash flows are today, uh, do you see that this uh, uh, growth capex uh, at some point of time gets, uh, you know, upsized far higher or does Tata look at growth beyond steel uh, given where the cash flows are? So I think, uh, you know, where we are, like you said, given the optionalities, we are in a very comfortable place, right? So between uh, Nilachal, Kaling Nilachal, we can take it from 1 million to 10 million during this decade. Kalinganagar, you can take it from 8 million to 16 million during the decade. Uh, uh, Angul, you can take it from 5 million to 10 million during the decade. So we can choose to, uh, we can choose where do we want to grow depending on what is the mo most optimal way to grow for us. In addition, we have the optionality to grow uh, through these electric arc furnace units, and that is going to be capital light growth for us because we have partners who are willing to set up these facilities for us, you know, because uh, uh, it's more about the ecosystem which we manage, uh, the brand that we have and the distribution network that we have than the, in the assets that we create in that model. So uh, so we have an optionality to have capital light growth there. And if the first one operates well, then we can scale it up very fast. So the 40 million roadmap has multiple options. The options that I've just articulated can take us beyond 40. But so we have those optionalities and we will exercise whatever is the most capital efficient and the value accretive uh, way to grow. Uh, as far as cash flows is ca are concerned, as you can see, the India cash flows have always been strong. And as we scale up the India business, we believe that we can generate enough cash to take care of our growth without having to borrow. Right. In fact, uh, as Kaushik said, we are basically uh, confident that we can grow as well as uh, deleverage uh, uh, at the same time. We are already investing uh, in what we call knowledge intensive uh, growth, which is basically new materials. Uh, we are already into fiber reinforced polymers. We are into uh, uh, medical materials. Uh, so basically we are looking at materials which are more knowledge intensive than capital intensive. We are into graphene. Uh, these are all businesses which are scaling up uh, uh, you know, the revenues is already from pretty much close to zero of two, three years back is crossing 500 crores this year and will cross four digits uh, in the near future. So these are businesses which are growing, which uh, supplement our growth in steel. You must also remember, we will also be growing in mining. We are currently at about 30, 35 million tons of mining. We'll take it about 60, 65 million tons to support the steel uh, growth. It's more for capital consumption. So I think uh, we feel that... Uh, uh, keeping the balance sheet health intact, uh, we can continue to grow in India from the cash flows that we generate in India. 
and uh, that will help us realize our ambitions. Uh, uh, so as of now, this is uh, the plan. Kaushik, I don't know if you want to supplement. No, I think uh, you, you've said it all. I think all that in one single sentence, I would just tell Pinakin that yes, there is a uh, realistic uh, expectation for upscaling the capital allocation and growth uh, in the coming years. And uh, most of these are getting finalized uh, the as far as specific execution plan is concerned so we would we have started this year with the allocation guidance of 12000 crores but we will review it in the first 6 months and come back and and see as to what uh, there is an upside bias potentially to accelerate some of the growth projects understood thank you very much for this before we take the next question, I would like to inform the participants to please limit your audio questions to two per participant. I would also request you to please keep your background clear to avoid any disturbance. Should you have a follow up question, you are requested to rejoin the queue or post it in the chat box. The next question is from Abhijit Mitra of ICICI Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, I hope I'm audible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so first question is on, on on shareholder return. So any framework that uh, we should look at it. I mean, uh, it's it's great to see 51 rupees uh, uh, in dividend this year, but but what's the framework to look at it? Should we sort of take this payout ratio or um, uh, because clearly uh, you know over the next couple of years it seems uh, like uh, you know your 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 cash flow generation would would you know be much higher than probably what you can probably allocate towards your growth capital project. So, so any framework that you can give on that, that's my first question. And second question is, is, is a bit, uh, you know, offbeat and then probably to Mr. Narendran, and given your air separation units in Jamshedpur and Kalinganagar, um, is there any possibility to sort of look at production of this inert gases like neon and others? Uh, you know, have you sort of looked at it? Any thoughts on that would be great. Thanks. Sure. So uh, I'll answer the second one and let Kaushik answer the first one. So we did, uh, when I heard that neon gas is basically made uh, in steel plants in Ukraine, that was one of the first things we looked at to see that uh, is there something that can be done there. But actually what we understood is, uh, uh, you know, it calls for significant investment uh, because the separation units that we use for currently oxygen, nitrogen, et cetera, in a steel plant, uh, uh, you need to you need to have one which is uh, you know in some sense far bigger in intensity or capacity however you describe it it needs to do a lot more to get neon out of it and uh, I understand the economic value is not there so much just now there is a shortage so typically in Ukraine also it has been a government supported uh, initiative uh, and obviously they had a lot of spare capacity which they leveraged and there was a government support and hence you have a strong production of neon. So it doesn't really make uh, commercial sense as far as we know. Just now maybe, but uh, that's only as long as uh, there's no neon gas coming out of Ukraine. So we did look at that, but for now we are not pursuing it. Kaushik? Yeah. I think uh, you, know, you would have seen last year also we scaled up our payout and, and, and the um, dividend percentage and, and also the dividend per share to 25 rupees, which was one of the highest recent history. I think as we have, we are basically triangulating the capital allocation between deleveraging return to shareholders and growth for growth capex. So I think that's the triangulation. I think the heavy lifting on um, on the deleveraging has uh, has happened. We continue on the same journey of a uh, billion dollars uh, every year. We've been overperforming in the last few years. Uh, therefore, it is important now to uh, Look at the return to shareholders commensurate with earnings, and that's been addressed uh, this this year. Um, it, our stated policy has been 50 percent of uh, of the of the PAT up to 50 percent. That's been the ceiling, but we've been progressing on that basis. Uh, good thing is our consolidated uh, earnings is is what is being uh, focused on, and uh, we this year are on a standalone basis. We have been about 19 20 percent. We we'll continue to look at this to a be consistent uh, and b to be commensurate with uh, with the uh, with the earnings and three to also prioritize uh, the future value of the company, which is through the growth capex. So it's a uh, it's not a simple formula, but it's effectively a triangulation of priorities and, and ensuring that we can optimize on the same. 
So that's that's a that's a approach that we are taking, and we'll continue to consistently apply that approach in the future. Sure. Thanks. That's all from us. The next question is from Vishal of Motilal Oswal. Please go ahead. Audible? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so my first question was with regards to your long-term uh, carbon plans for Europe. Given the fact that your uh, competitors, SSAB, Thyssen, etc., they have um, all lined up capex of about four to five billion dollars over the next uh, four or five years to transition into green steel. Uh, what would be our uh, strategy in Europe in that regard? That's the yeah. first question. Yeah. So Vishal. Uh... So basically, the approach is different for uh, uh, UK and for Netherlands. Uh, in Netherlands, the plans, uh, both in both places, there are plans which have been made and there are conversations which are going on with the uh, respective governments. So in Netherlands, uh, the roadmap that uh, we've already articulated in some sense is about transitioning from coal to gas to hydrogen, right? But uh, that uh, the starting point is there needs to be gas available in plenty and at the right price. Uh, which was there, but now with what's happening with uh, Ukraine and Russia and the calls that the European governments are going to take, we are waiting to see what their plan is because uh, Netherlands does depend on Russian gas. And uh, it, I think it's about 30 to 40 percent of the gas used in the Netherlands comes from Russia. So we're waiting to see what that happens. There is a view in Europe that they may transition faster into hydrogen. So we'll wait and see what happens and then decide our plans. Uh, so we do have the plans uh, already in place. And I think the cash flows that they're generating in Netherlands uh, will be used to support this transition. And I think uh, uh, the Dutch business is generating uh, the EBITDAs and the cash uh, will generate the cash uh, that we feel should support this transition. Of course, we will also look at uh, certainty and support from the government, if not in CapEx and OPEX. As far as uh, UK is concerned, uh, the transition plan is more around making better use of the scrap that is available in the UK. UK is one of those uh, countries which exports scrap. So how can you, again, transition into a process route which uses more scrap? But uh, unlike in Netherlands, where the, uh, the business, the existing business can uh, support the transition in UK, the transition cannot happen unless it's supported by the government. So that's a conversation going on with the government. Uh, so we will, uh, you know, move ahead based on how we are progressing in these conversations. In the meanwhile, at least as far as Netherlands is concerned, we will continue to build the corpus that is required for the transition. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, elaborate answer, sir. So my uh, second question was with regard to the uh, steel cycle. Now, we have been uh, looking at never like before steel prices in Europe, in the Asian markets, but China uh, has started slowing down and, and it's not known whether and how much of stimulus they will do. So in that scenario, um, do you think it would be more prudent uh, to bring down the leverage uh, or the absolute debt levels significantly uh, low before embarking on the growth capex because uh, once we commit to a growth capex beyond a certain point in time, we enter into a point of no return. So the capex has to be committed. And, and overall, in the past cycles also, we have seen uh, steel companies have committed to large amount of growth capex at the peak of the cycle. And after the cycle has turned around, it has been very difficult in managing the uh, debt uh, subsequently. So uh, just wanted your thoughts on how do we think because steel is a cycle the prices will never stay uh, at the current levels for a for a long time it has to come yeah. down so uh, vishal i just want to respond uh, uh, with two three uh, points one is uh, at a very fundamental level the steel industry is structurally in a different place right so uh, i'm not saying steel prices will stay at this level forever but uh, the disruptors of the past which has largely been uh, Significant capacity being added, which was happening in China, uh, you know, 50, 60 million tons of capacity was being added a year in uh, 10 years back or 15 years back. And secondly, exports out of China used to was the biggest disruptor. 
today you don't have that situation even though steel prices are high apart from in india nobody else is really adding capacity okay so the supply demand imbalance that is created by a lot of capacity coming quickly on stream will not happen and no other country will be able to add capacity as fast as china did even if india wants to add 50 million tons a year it won't be able to right so to me that is one uh, change from the past when steel prices were high the second fact is a lot of uh, capital is being invested to transition to green so steel companies the cost operating cost of steel companies are also going up not only because of input cost but also because of capex being spent as you as uh, you asked or uh, uh, it was asked earlier in this call of other spending capex so there is a bit of a down uh, kind of uh, uh, what do you call it a bottom below which steel companies will not be motivated to sell steel prices and with china not being a big exporter at cheap prices there is nobody else who's disruptor the other big disrupt to some extent low prices were available from ukraine and russia and that is also uh, uh, not there the third point i want to make is you know when you look at steel companies growing when it's inorganic growth there's a lot of uh, money spent in a short period of time and then if the steel cycle turns uh, you struggle when you're doing organic growth you have an option which we did for instance that's what we did in kalinganagar we slowed down the project when uh, we felt that uh, there is a need to focus more on deleveraging after the bhushan acquisition so we did that and uh, brought down our debt and now today we are able to ramp up so we have that optionality even if we start projects in the multiple sites that we have we have an optionality to slow it down if we feel that uh, uh, things are not going the way uh, we see it but having said that given that the india business is double the size it was 5 years back or 10 years back and is continuing to grow the cash flows that you will generate in a down cycle for tata steel is going to be much higher than it was in the past even in the lowest point of the last cycle the ebitda margin of the steel business in india was 20% okay so now the uh, base on which you are generating 20% ebitda margin is doubled and is increasing so from a structural point of view tata steel is also in a very different place than it was 5 years back or 7 8 years back and that's what gives us the uh, confidence that we should be able to grow without adding to our debt and we can pace our growth well because we have multiple sites and optionalities available yeah so just to follow up on this you mentioned that you know there is no more capacity addition happening uh, and therefore you know uh, there is no such disruptor but at the same time uh, the the counterpoint over here uh, what we also hear is that uh, the consumption has also slowed down significantly not only in china but across the world and therefore but the mills which are already have been commissioned over the last decade or two continue to churn out the same amount of steel so therefore on one hand while there are no more uh, additional capacities being uh, built the existing capacities themselves are uh, sufficient enough to enough to flood the uh, market so just wanted to you know yeah. from that language so yeah so vishal uh, basically what if you see the world steel association forecast uh, the steel consumption is forecasted to continue to grow but the where it is growing is changing you know the growth outside china is today more than the growth in china okay so china is pretty pretty flat growth but also we should keep in mind if uh, you know china grows 1% uh, that itself is uh, 8 10 million tons you know so uh, so that's that's the kind of thing which is uh, uh, happening today and uh, so we are not seeing we are not seeing and a lot of capacities which you see are coming up even in china electric arc furnace capacities replacing the smaller blast furnaces the induction furnaces which they closed so that's why china's exports are stuck at 4 5 million tons for the last few years right it's not increasing right even if consumption is not been growing so much but consumption is still at 950 million uh, tons and billion tons uh, in india the consumption is growing in southeast asia it's growing africa has not even started it's 1 billion people consuming 40 million tons of steel right so uh, and lot of uh, you know consumption yet to come in many other parts of the world so there is a view that uh, i mean if you see the world steel long term forecast the steel consumption is going to continue to grow and like i said capacity addition is nowhere near what it was what was happening when china was growing right so that's where uh, i mean we can debate this point but we feel that uh, the situation is different today than it was 15 years back if i may just add to your previous uh, question uh, vishal i think the other point since you started the point by saying why not deleverage more so at no point are we saying that we have stopped deleveraging we are saying that we will continue our deleveraging path 
and uh, we are not saying that our uh, the leverage will be the the provider of capital for our growth so our balance sheet uh, priority remains the same all that we are saying is that we would allocate capital more for accelerating first priority is to complete kalinganagar which helps us to uh, complete our existing project and then look at an uh, upward bias taking all the factors so i'm just replying or adding to what i replied to abhijit say it's a triangulation of deleveraging return to shareholders as well as capex because there is a need to continue to grow capacity competitively looking at new technologies and looking at different business models and that builds in lot more sustainability to dara steel in the future and i think that is something that we would continue to focus on so it's not that it's one or the other it is a combination of and balancing of priorities is from prashant kp of dolat capital please go ahead it looks like we have lost our line with prashant we will now proceed to our next question the next question is from anuj singla of from bank of america please go ahead hear me yeah yeah anuj yeah uh, thank you very much for the opportunity uh, so kashik i think uh, this quarter again a, a very impressive performance on deleveraging uh, what took me by surprise was the uh, cap- working capital reduction so can you talk about uh, you know what steps are being taken and you talked about uh, the debtor and the inventory days uh, being brought down as well so can we expect this to sustain in the next year given where coking coal prices are and uh, you know we have also seen iron ore pricing being elevated how sustainable are these working capital initiatives going into uh, next year so uh, anuj i think all of these initiatives are sustainable provided we look at it from a full year perspective and not from a quarter on quarter perspective because the volatility the way it it uh, it is running for example our purchase price of coal in in for example in march is going to reflect in the consumption cost in uh, in this quarter similarly the it it happens with the lag so there is and there is also a, uh, in terms of the debtors uh, the value of the uh, debtors is much higher not because of the tonnages represented by it but because of the prices so certainly we are looking uh, very sharply and continue to look look at it and i think it is more structural than just being a one off measure uh, i think you have to look at it across for example just now I'm, i would i would urge that we look look at the first half in totality as we move forward but uh, and then the second half and then for the full year i think uh, the full year basis i think we are very confident that we'll continue on the same path okay got it and the second question is with regards to the capital allocation uh, mr narendran did point about about the uh, about the growth optionality on the organic side now there are a couple of assets which are on the block on the inorganic side um, nmdc plant rinl plant uh, i mean uh, yeah, we have asked this question before as well but just want to you know get your thoughts again what is the uh, strategy around that in terms of bidding uh, are we now very comfortable with the organic growth pipeline and they will take a back seat how, how do we look at the growth trajectory um, uh, for the 40 million tons uh, uh, you know target which we have over the next decade so i think sorry go ahead go ahead go ahead i think um, if i were to look at uh, our current footprint that narin uh, elaborated on between Uh, nilachal uh, kalinganagar and in meramandli which is the ex uh, bushan steel uh, uh, facility there are there are significant opportunities for scaling up growth in each of these sites using state of the art technologies using carbon friendly approaches uh, or paths that helps us to reduce our intensity and add to that the uh, greenfield sites that we are talking about as far as uh, the electric arc furnace process is concerned so pretty much set for now but if there are opportunities we will not will not will have a look at it for sure but i think our base plan considers these organic growths and i think that's where the capital allocation will be helpful uh, that's where the 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 trade off and the paybacks are much better 
uh, it's all brown feed. It can be paced and it can be allocated as we earn. So I think that's our base plan. Um, opportunities come about in, in various uh, various areas. We look at it, but uh, it has to meet some hurdle rates uh, given our uh, counterfactual on the organic growth. Got it, sir. And last question, if I may. Uh, on the global footprint, uh, we were earlier looking for uh, some kind of uh, strategic uh, solution to the European assets. Uh, uh, so uh, given where steel prices and spreads are right now, are we comfortable with the kind of profits and cash flows we are making there? And does that plan take a backseat now or we continue to explore opportunities there? Thank you. So I think, uh, you know, to be fair, at this point of time, we've gone through a strategic restructuring of our European business. We've separated Netherlands and UK. Each one of them are pursuing their transformation plan and their decarbonization plan. That's a, and that's a very important part of uh, the long-term value of uh, Tata Steel in Netherlands and Tata Steel in UK. So as, as part of that, uh, our focus is currently on getting these things right pushing for higher value higher value through the cash flows and the earnings. And if there are opportunities as part of this, we'll certainly look at it. Uh, there is never a, but it has to be done in a manner where the priority is the decarbonization. Priority is the way in which we are generating profits and cash flows. And I think that, that remains the single most important thing for the local management as well as for us in, as a shareholder. Um, and therefore, uh, I wouldn't kind of say that we are comfortable or not comfortable. That's not how we look at it. We look at it, what's the immediate priority? And I think in Netherlands, as well as in the UK, getting the best of the current situation in the market and getting cost out, getting the transformation programs continue to deliver uh, is the most important priority so that we can ensure that we anyway create value out of these enterprises. Thank you very much, sir. The next question is from Sagar Doshi. Please go ahead. The question is regarding the CAPEX at Kalina Nagar plant. So uh, the uh, what top line addition will we get uh, by completing this CAPEX? What could I expect in let's say the last quarter of FY23 once this CAPEX extends? So that's the first question. Yeah. So Sagar, basically the, this year we will complete the pellet plant, which more has a cost impact than a revenue impact. Uh, it will have a significant cost impact uh, once we commission it. The cold rolling mill, <coughs> the, what we call the PLTCM will get commissioned. Uh, that will give us uh, what we call full hard cold roll product, uh, which will have to be annealed and galvanized. The annealing and galvanizing facilities will uh, come up uh, in the... Uh, you know, last quarter of this year and the first two quarters of the next financial year. So the revenue side impact will be felt more in the uh, in FI24 than in FI23. In FI23, we'll start realizing the cost benefits of Kalingaragar and the full revenue benefit impacts will start flowing through from the subsequent years when the blast furnace is up and you have 5 million tons additional production in place. Okay, got it. Also, just uh, one more thing on cooking coal, as we see that uh, it's uh, increase in the price has escalated. So uh, how much of the cooking coal requirements that we have uh, that we have is, uh, let's say, sourced in-house and how much we need to buy from outside? So what's the ratio? And do we have any steps to increase our in-house production at this stage? So the in-house uh, in India, it's 25 percent in-house, 75 percent uh, uh, bought out. In Europe, it's, of course, 100 percent bought out. Uh, in India, we are planning to uh, increase our capacity, double our capacity, but because our steel production is also going to double, the percentages will be in the 20 to 25 percent. Okay, thank you, sir. I would now like to hand over the conference to Ms. Shah for the chat questions. Over to you, ma'am. Yeah, thank you, Kinshu. Um, I think we have a number of chat questions, and let's try and uh, answer uh, as many as we can. Uh, the first question is on the recent coal shortage in India. Um, is there any impact on operations of customer operations and orders? Uh, Narendra, would you like to take this? Yeah. So, uh, you know, what we buy is largely metallurgical coal, which we import. Uh, so there we are not impacted uh, by the coal shortage. But the DRI operations that we have in uh, Bhushan, erstwhile Bhushan, which is what we call Tata Steel Vira Mandli, and uh, the Gamari operations, which is the Tata Steel Long Products uh, operation, 
uh, buys DRI. That also we import a lot from South Africa, etc. Uh, so there, there is sometimes a bit of a, uh, I wouldn't say available. I mean, it's a challenge. That's all. It, it's not that we have to shut down the operations because coal is not available. As far as the customers are concerned, uh, uh, you know, I, I think wherever the states there are power cuts, yes, some of the customers are impacted. But it also impacts uh, producers because a lot of secondary steel producers are also dependent on power supply. So as of now, we are not seeing the demand impact significant or material. Uh, you know, so it's something we're watching, but not yet uh, having a direct impact on us. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there are a couple of questions on our uh, guidance on sales. Um, so this is for FI23 for uh, Tata Steel in general. And there's also a question on NINL in terms of uh, sales from NINL expected in this year. So uh, the guidance on sales for this year is uh, uh, without NINL is about half a million tons more because we are pretty much running full out across all our capacity. So till the five million tons comes out of Kalinganagar, uh, whatever incremental sales we do is more through debottlenecking. Of course, there will be significant value addition once a coal rolling mill comes in Kalinganagar because that's adding value to the existing uh, uh, sales mix. We will, of course, continue to uh, enrich the sales mix also through more sales to the more uh, value accretive segment. So all that continues. As far as Nilachal is concerned, the capacity is a million tons, but the plant has not been operational for the last two years. We are confident that we can get the plant started, uh, at least the blast furnace started uh, within three months of getting, getting ownership of the facilities, which we hope to have during this quarter. And uh, the coke ovens there will need a bit more time. Uh, but by the end of this uh, financial year, we hope to be operating at the rate, which is uh, 100,000 tons, 80 to 100,000 tons a month. Uh, how much of production will we have during the year? I think we'll be in a better position to give that guidance once we uh, have ownership of the place. I think when we do the Q1 call, maybe we'll be able to give you a more specific guidance. Thank you. A uh, couple of questions on the financials. Uh, first one is, what is the net debt target for FI23 and 24? I think you answered that question, but I think it's uh, coming uh, consistently. So maybe you just want to re-clarify. I keep saying it again that uh, we have an announced policy of a billion dollars and uh, let's stick to it. We've just started the year. We'll see how the um, market and the business works and uh, the cash flows and based on that we'll we'll take a call but certainly a billion dollar and that's something which we have committed to. Thank you. Uh, the other question is on the swing in EBITDA of other India operations uh, which we have in, in other India and other trade related operations uh, which we have. Can you explain why there has been such a huge swing and how do you see this going forward? So I think the uh, other, in, are you talking about the other income? No, other EBITDA. So uh, India, Europe, and the other EBITDA. So the other EBITDA effectively, sorry, <clears throat> sorry effectively re uh, reflects our uh, other subsidiary companies. And uh, I think most of them are doing uh, significantly well. Um, we have, uh, we have a, uh, Apart from one or two companies, I think most of them have uh, performed well. And I think consistently we should have an additional other income from subsidiaries, uh, uh, which would uh, continue to uh, beef up our consolidated EBITDA. Um, thank you. Um, there is a question which we have on Russia. Um, what is the rationale behind cutting ties uh, with Russia for Indian operations, especially when they are cooking coal can be procured at a discount at a time uh, when cooking coal costs are at a record peak and have squeezed margins? Yeah, so I think, uh, uh, you know, obviously there were operational issues and other complexities because we are a global company of operating across footprints. Uh, uh, certainly in Europe, uh, we couldn't uh, be buying from Russia. And in India also, it was not that we were buying significant volumes. And, uh, uh, and there was also a lack of clarity in between on how can we transact and as a uh, company, as a company and a part of group, which has a global footprint, uh, a call was taken that uh, we will uh, not be transacting with Russia for now. Also, we Thank use you. the uh, procurement always on a value in use basis. So, um, and given our long uh, contracts and 
customer rela supplier relationships with their existing custom uh, suppliers, it was a prudent thing to do. Thank you. Uh, there's a question on Europe, which we will take. Uh, I think there is an, uh, just trying to get greater clarity on the performance. Uh, so it says in terms of operations, what has really driven Q on Q, on Q profitability for Europe? Because realizations did not move materially uh, as the EBITDA per ton, uh, because there was a steep hike in all cost items. Uh, was the offset on INO Q and Q decline so material? So there was a uh, about a hundred million pounds uh, lower on cost of raw materials, uh, which is essentially because the lower cost of uh, iron ore offset the higher cost of coal, uh, and that's been uh, one of the uh, areas. The liquidation of inventory, uh, which was uh, which was there, uh, is the other element. But uh, actually, the prices have also increased. So I'm not sure why they are saying that the revenues have not increased because uh, the contracted prices have been reflected. Uh, the contracts which were renewed in December and the third quarter have fully reflected in the fourth quarter. So I think uh, it, it's been a spread increase which reflected in the EBITDA increase. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there are a couple of uh, questions on uh, the subsidiaries. Uh, so the first question is on Tata Steel Long Products. Is there a business case to merge uh, Tata Steel Long Products with Tata Steel? Post the changes in the MMDRA, which are leading to a higher royalty incidence on Tata Steel long products. And the second question is a request for an update on the merger with uh, with Tata Metallics. Uh, I think last time we had said we are reviewing it, so the you know the question is on an update on the same. So as far as the first one is concerned, uh, we continue to look at options uh, as to what is best to, to avoid any value leakage. There are other operating models that we are also evaluating, um, which, which if it is economically viable, will be implemented. Uh, Tata Steel Long Products, as uh, everyone knows, is also the company which bid for NINL, and there are certain restrictions at this point of time as part of the process uh, to do any corporate actions. Uh, we will continuously review it, which is also indicative of the Tata Metallics merger process because the, the entity which uh, was used for valuation at that point of time is very different at this point of time. So therefore we are looking at all of this. It's taking a bit of time because we first want to close the NINL and then take a call on the whole consolidation play for the long products and other subsidiaries. Thank you. Um, there is a question um, on, uh, on our performance on EBITDA per ton. Um, you know, as everybody knows, we don't give an guidance, but I think maybe a slightly more uh, deeper flavor. So the question is, we expect in Q1, the NRs uh, we have indicated will increase by around eight, eight and a half thousand per ton. But we also say that cooking coal consumption costs to increase by about hundred dollars. So is it fair to assume that the EBITDA per ton sequentially can be maintained? Yes. Answer is yes. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, and I think we'll take one more chat question before moving back to audio. Um, so the question is, do you have any uh, uh, update into, or any targets in terms of uh, revenues for your new material businesses, the graphene, ceramics, et cetera? And similarly, do you have a target for your downstream revenues uh, by 2025? So the new materials business uh, uh, is crossing five, has crossed 500 crores, and uh, uh, you know we expect it to cross uh, about 1,000 crores over the next few years. We've just uh, uh, invested in medical materials, which we think is a great uh, hydroxy appetite and things like that, which we think has great potential for growth because a lot of it is imported today. So we're doing a lot of work on that. There's a very aggressive growth plans, uh, certainly four-digit kind of numbers uh, very quickly, and then uh, let's see how we can scale it up further. They are newer businesses for us, uh, so we've had good traction so far. So uh, at one point in time, we were chasing 10% of our revenues from new materials, but since then, our own existing revenues have gone up very significantly. So uh, so we will uh, revisit that, but uh, the ambition is there. There's going to be very significant growth, uh, obviously, uh, double-digit CAG, CAGR, if not more. What was the other one, uh, uh, Samita? That uh, on the subsidiary, on the downstream. Yeah, Kaushik, you want to? 
take that. So, yeah. so downstream subsidiary, uh, you're talking, I don't know whether the question relates to the uh, SPDL. Uh, it actually, I think it's referring to our downstream volumes, okay. not in subsidiaries, but, you know, okay, the tubes. Fine. So then let me take that. Uh, so basically, if you look at it, we are a very strong player in many downstream businesses in tubes with the Bushin acquisition. We have now become a very big player. We were already quite big. So we are one of the largest in India, uh, both in precision tubes, regular pipes, uh, structural pipes, etc. So we are more than a million tons and continuing to grow. In wires, again, we are the largest in India and we are again uh, chasing a million tons of uh, wires. Uh, the Nilachal acquisition will give us an upstream that is required to further support growth in downstream. In tin plate and packaging, we are doubling. We are in the middle of an expansion. In galvanized products also, we are uh, significantly expanding uh, with Kalinganagar. Uh, the Bhushan acquisition is, will also help us grow the color-coded footprint that we have, which will also more than double. Currently, we are on the joint venture with Blue Scope, but uh, this facility together with that more than doubles our footprint uh, in uh, quoted products. So pretty much in all the downstream businesses we are in, in addition, of course, we are moving more and more into solutions, uh, whether it is uh, uh, nesting solutions, which is again a business which is doubling every year, uh, which is now, uh, you know, and also our doors, windows, those kind of uh, solutions for the house builder with whom we already have a relationship. Again, this is a business, uh, all these businesses have grown to about 500 crores now. And again, we'll cross 1,000 crores uh, very quickly. So uh, we believe that going more downstream, going more into solutions will uh, help us uh, ride the cyclicality much better. Thank you. Um, I think there are a couple of uh, questions which I will just take and then move um, back to audio. So uh, I think some clarity in terms of uh, NR increase. I think India, we've said in Europe as well, but seems to be a lot of questions. So maybe just a flavor of what we expect on the NR side uh, in Europe, particularly. About 60 euros a ton, uh, Q1 compared to Q4. And in India, we said about 8,000 to 8,500 rupees per ton, Q1 compared to Q4. Thank you. Uh, with this, we will go back to audio questions and over to you, Kinshu. Thank you, ma'am. The next question is from Ritesh Shah of Investec. Please go ahead. Hello. Am yeah, I audible? Yes. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so I had a couple of questions. Uh, first was uh, any timelines on the relining of the furnace for Tata Steel Netherlands? Uh, and will it have any impact on volumes? How should one look at uh, the CAPEX uh, related to that? That's one. And secondly, you also did indicate about uh, moving from coal to gas to hydrogen. Uh, what are the timelines that uh, we are looking at and how should one understand this uh, in a better way if one is taking a, a three to five year call on the company? So as far as uh, Netherlands is concerned, the blast one is, uh, Six is actually due for a reline. It was due sometime back and we extended it as much as possible. It's being prepared for a reline sometime next year. But in anticipation of that, we've been building slab stocks and uh, some of the working capital increase that you see in Europe is because of the slab stocks that we've been building. Uh, so when the furnace goes down, the, the uh, downstream facilities will continue to have the feedstock that is required. So the volume impact will be minimized. Uh, it uh, it is going to happen towards the end of this financial year, and uh, you know we'll give more specific guidance on that. But largely, like I said, we're trying to insulate the volume impact by building up the slab stock. In fact, there'll be a cash re release as you use up the working capital, uh, which is today locked in those uh, slab stocks. Uh, the BF7, which is a bigger blast furnace, uh, when it comes up for relining, that is the one which we want to transition first. Uh, you know, but again, uh, that needs to now be. Uh, reconciled with the uh, gas situation in uh, Europe and whether the gas that was available earlier is going to continue to be available uh, given this issue uh, between EU and Russia as far as gas supplies is concerned. So we'll take that call. This is something we are working very closely with the government and we will take that decision to transition to gas once we have clarity and comfort uh, that gas is available. Hydrogen was due to be available to us by the end of the decade. Uh, and again, uh, it may happen earlier if EU wants to transition quicker to hydrogen. 
but uh, we will align our timelines with the timelines of availability of both gas and hydrogen and plan accordingly. Sure. Uh, sir, my second question was on mining capacities. We have indicated that it will go to 60 to 65 million tons by 2030. Uh, I think we already have the growth optionality to put more into the market. So how should one look at merchant sales, uh, say, three years, five years out? Because that's one variable which we do not capture in our models. So as far as INOR is concerned, uh, we have two kinds of uh, mines with us. The ones which we have from the past, which are captive mines. Uh, there is an optionality if you are fully meeting your requirements to sell some at a higher premium, etc. But today, uh, you know, the rate at which you're building steel capacity, I think the mining capacity is just about able to keep pace with it. The second one is what we bid and won. And we have deliberately bid for what are more greenfield mines, which takes a few years to develop uh, because we wanted that capacity to be in place as we come closer to 2030 when our existing mines will go up for auction. So uh, we may not have uh, much available uh, to sell in the market apart from some fines, et cetera, uh, you know, uh, out of some of the mines. So it's not going to be very material to, uh, uh, you know, the merchant mine opportunity is not going to be very material for us, at least for the next few years. But post-2030, of course, that's certainly an optionality which we can leverage. It's an optionality for us in the Cromore side uh, where we've got the mines. And, uh, of course, there also we would prefer to value add than sell the ore. The next question is from Indrajit Agarwal of CLSA. Please go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, 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 we can. There was some voice in the background. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, so two questions from my side. First, uh, can you uh, help us understand the carbon situation in Europe currently? What is the availability, the allocation, and would you uh, would we have to end up buying something for FI twenty? and what kind of cost impact would it have? Okay. Yeah, so, yeah, so in uh, in Europe, we, the, as you know, that there are, uh, there's a mechanism whereby we get the free allowances um, from the government or the regulator based on the average production for the last three, year, three years. And then there is the uh, gap to the free allowances, which then takes, uh, you have to buy from the market. So as far as uh, Netherlands and UK are concerned, in Netherlands in particular, we produce about, say, uh, liquid steel of 6.9 million tons, and therefore there is an emission of about 12 million tons. Um, and the allocation is uh, about, say, 10 million tons. So there is a gap of 2 to 2.3 million tons, and that's something that uh, is built into the plan to uh, purchase from the market. The EU ETS price, uh, and I'm tall, or talking about last year's numbers, and uh, the EU ETS price has drawn up to, say, 80, 80, uh, 80 euros per ton. So that's been factored in the performance that you see in, in, in the year. And uh, typically that is, uh, that's, some, that's something that will continue for the future, and which is why the decarbonization uh, is going to work. So we expect uh, a, a gap of about a million and a half uh, to two million tons uh, a, in Europe, uh, in Netherlands, and also in the UK. Uh, and that's the uh, part that you have to buy from the market to uh, put, to kind of meet the requirements. Uh, there are ways in which you can mitigate it or spread it over time because you also get free allowances ahead of uh, ahead of the usage. And that's why you would uh, see us uh, working to optimize that model. But fundamentally, we have a uh, gap to the free allowances. And over a period of time, these free allowances, uh, uh, somewhere around 2030 to 32 or 33, will uh, eventually come down. So by which time, we must have our uh, configuration ready where we don't depend on uh, the external purchase. Sure, thank you. That's helpful. Uh, secondly, can you throw some light on how European steel demand has been, particularly given the sharp rise in prices over there? Are you seeing some pushbacks in terms of demand getting weaker gradually? I think the uh, demand has been uh, quite strong, actually. Uh, the challenge has been more with the auto sector because they have struggled a bit because of semiconductor issues, uh, uh, etc. 
but otherwise so far the demand has not been an issue in fact uh, uh, what's also happening is on the supply side as you know russia and ukraine are no longer in the european market and that has created a gap on the supply side which is why the prices in europe shot up uh, so the demand supply balance is uh, there you know it's not disrupted so sure. one last question if i may uh, you highlighted about uh, several year based capacity expansion in india particularly the northern and western side uh, how confident are you on the scrap availability or the raw material availability in, in domestically or do you think do you will have to bank a lot on imports for that so currently the thinking is more to leverage what is available domestically we believe that the scrap collection and recycling ecosystem in india uh, uh you know uh, can be better organized and also the elv and end of life vehicle uh, thing which is coming in is also going to generate a lot of scrap so we will partner with uh, dismantlers auto companies are themselves setting up dismantling facilities we are not interested in dismantling but the steel component of the car is something we are interested in and so we will tie up with dismantlers take the scrap in addition to that there is prom scrap which is generated from manufacturing practices so we will set up the scrap processing centers closer to where we feel scrap will be generated and hence the first one in rohtak and we are looking at other sites in the west and south where scrap is being generated uh, the whole uh, approach is about collecting the scrap melting it rolling it casting it fabricating it etc and selling it within the same vicinity so not only do you uh, produce steel through a more carbon efficient route the uh, carbon footprint of the whole supply chain is also minimized because uh, there is not much of movement of either the input or the output so that's the model we believe it's going to be important to have a more carbon efficient uh, footprint going forward and it's easier for us to scale up uh, faster once we get the model and the uh, operations right before we take the next question i would like to remind the participants to please limit your audio questions to two per participant should you have a follow up question we request you to please rejoin the queue or post it in the chat box the next question is from kirtan mehta of bob capital please go ahead for me yes please yeah i had a sort of question on the nnl you have indicated that your first priority is to sort of take it up to a rated volume of 1 million ton and in the longer term there is an optionality to increase it to 10 million ton would it be possible to share the options that you would be considering to develop your long products portfolio at this point of time what could come over next 2 3 years so chetan there are few things which are happening one is uh, there is already a project ongoing to add a rolling mill uh, uh, to the uh, what is called tata steel long products that will add about 400000 tons uh, of rolling capacity because we have steel making capacity which is not fully utilized so we can leverage that that is one thing which is going on and it will help us supply steels to the passenger car industry forging quality steels uh, to the passenger car industry the second one is nilachan nilachan like i said has a, a footprint of about a million tons currently and uh, we can very quickly ramp it up to 4 million tons it will all be long products all the nilachan expansion will be long products just like expansion in kalinganagar or angul or miramandli will be flat products so yeah, miramandli and angul is the same place so uh, so uh, the long products opportunities are threefold one is value addition in existing tata steel long products two is the electric arc facility uh, facility which we talked about and using scrap recycling and the third is the nilachal expansion so these are the three opportunities that we will pursue for long products right and on long products at nilachal to take it up to 4 million ton what level of capex would it require some initial color so uh, it it is like building any any greenfield site it will of course be a bit less because it's long products normally the flat products cost is much uh, higher so uh, you know if you're looking at adding about uh, 4 million tons maybe about 20 25000 crores is what uh, we think but we will come to a better estimate once we get into the site and do a more detailed uh, analysis The next question is from Anupam Gupta of IIFL. Please go ahead. Kirtna, 
Anupam, there seems to be a network issue at your end as we are unable to hear you clearly. We request you to please find a stable connection and rejoin the queue. We will now move to Kamlesh Bagmar from Prabhudas Lilagar. Please go ahead. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, Kausik, sir, one question for you, sir. Like, sir, how much spending is left uh, on uh, on uh, KPO projects as phase two? I believe it was a uh, twenty-three and a half thousand crore, which were uh, uh, which we had to plan uh, on spend on that expansion. But how much is left now? Till now, sir. About half of it. And uh, we are also uh, rescoped it uh, based on uh, the current requirements, etc. So roughly about half of it is there. Okay. And sir, uh, secondly, on this uh, provision related to Tata Steel mining, so how much we have provided provided in this particular quarter? And sir, can you give us some clarity that uh, the, the way the swing has been there in this uh, uh, other Indian operations? So, like, say, from a 400 crore, it moved down to, like, say, negative 900 crore. So, can you provide some some clarity on that part, how it can move going forward, or, like, say, so that we can factor in something for that in our quarterly earnings? So, I think uh, I would I would say that uh, there are two parts to Tata Steel Mining. Uh, one is uh, relating to the stock or inventory that was there, which was uh, which came from the from the previous mining uh, uh, Sukinda when we had gone in and we had uh, enhanced our mining and there were uh, what we have done is we have taken a net realizable value adjustment which is one time uh, that's around 500 odd crores 500 540 crores uh, second uh, is as part of the MDPA. Uh, there has been a certain amount of uh, penalty and demands that we've been asked to, from a compliance point of view because the law changed post our acquisition. The law was uh, the MDPA to be paid on production. Thereafter, it changed to dispatch. And then COVID happened. We can't, uh, we couldn't kind of use it for exports uh, because it has got prohibitive uh, export duty. Uh, but now with Rohit uh, Ferro, we have the ability to actually. Uh, use it for downstream ferrochrome conversion. Uh, so that is the that was almost about uh, six eight hundred crores of provisioning. So both are one time. The underlying business of all other subsidiaries have been very strong in India. Uh, so I think you can safely assume that this is one time and wouldn't get repeated. Um, so about thirteen hundred crores of the of the. Okay. Great. Great. Thanks a lot, sir. Thanks a lot. Sir. The next question is from Pallav Agarwal of Antique Limited. Please go ahead. Uh, it looks like we have lost our line with Pallav. We will now proceed to our next question. The next question is from Ashish Kejriwal of Centrum. Please go ahead. I think it's getting closer to lunch break. Yeah, I was about to say that. Ashish, if you can hear us, I think there is some uh, audio connectivity issue at uh, your end. If you can hear us, please do let us know. there's a connectivity issue so um i think with that we will uh, end the call um thank you everyone for joining us on the call today i hope uh, we could answer all your questions and i hope you found it useful and informative um thank you take care and we will join again um, next time bye bye thank you bye bye